CFC uh, was launched and established in 2011 with the financial assistance uh, from the Native American Development Bank and the United, United Kingdom uh, Development for International Development, uh, Department for International Development, known as DFID, and the then um, Canadian International Development Agency, CEDA, who is now uh, part of the Department for Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development. Um, certainly, the CCFC was established within the University of West Indies as a regional knowledge hub and competitiveness in small states, and it provides training and consulting services uh, to the public and private sector agencies. As I said earlier, its focus is really on measures to enhance the competitiveness, uh, productivity, and growth in the region. This is the second competitiveness forum, uh, which has as a theme competitiveness through global value chains, clustering, and innovation. Uh, the first conference was held in Trinidad and Tobago, and this certainly in, uh, ensures that the, the, the center continues that regional reach. Uh, I want, however, to, to signal to you, and, and I suggest if you have not done, uh, to, uh, to have a look at the, the CCFC's newsletter, which was uh, published in December 2013, because I think it gives us a, a good sense of the challenges faced uh, by the region in relation to competitiveness uh, the competitive environment. And I'm quite sure the director will make sure that uh, all of you have a copy of it, because I think it's a nice summary statement of the challenges that we expect. That's uh, so how we, we, we are faced. And of course, the other challenges that we have in the region, which we can spend, we hope we spend the whole year trying to resolve. So we expect, therefore, that the deliberations from uh, this conference or this forum uh, would provide implementable measures which can enhance the competitiveness of the region, um, especially in respect to the development of global value change, chains, um, clusters, and of course, the important area of innovation. Uh, I want to start uh, by extending a, a warm welcome to all of you who are uh, going to participate uh, in this forum. I particularly want to uh, congratulate Mrs. Indira Sajwan Ali, uh, who is the Executive Director for the Caribbean Center for Competitiveness, her team and uh, the partners who uh, uh, came together uh, to really make this uh, forum a reality. The forum was actually uh, going to be held in the regional headquarters of the University of the West Indies, and of course we are always uh, delighted to be able to show off our still new facilities, uh, but in truth, uh, better news was that the attendance was so uh, considerable today that uh, although we were able to house some 300 people, uh, of course not sitting like this, uh, we couldn't uh, house uh, this particular meeting. So indeed we're very pleased um, about the interest uh, that this uh, endeavor uh, has engendered. We uh, want to really also extend our thanks uh, to those who partnered uh, with us, the Private Sector Organization of Jamaica, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, the IDB uh, through the Compete Caribbean Initiative, the Caribbean Export Development Agency, the UK uh, Department of International Development, DFID, and what I used to call, and we all would prefer sometimes to say CEDA, that has now become the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and Development in Canada. And it's quite a, a handful, a mouthful anyway, uh, to deal with. But thank you uh, nevertheless. Um, as we've heard, the Caribbean Center for Competitiveness was launched uh, four years ago and it came through the funding uh, from the IDB, DFID, and uh, this now called Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade, and Development in Canada. I uh, remember uh, distinctly uh, when I attended the IDB meeting, at least sponsored meeting, four or five years ago in Barbados. And Starting hearing for the first time, I'm a, 
a physician after all, not an economist or business person, but hearing about this concept of competitiveness and clusters and, and so on, and I became enormously excited about it because here uh, things were being discussed in quantitative terms, which, you know, and there were graphs and diagrams and so on with which I uh, can connect very well, no matter what the subject is. And, and so when the opportunity came uh, to create this center for competitiveness uh, with a generous grant uh, from uh, the IDB and what used to be CEDAR, CEDAR Diffin, uh, and uh, so on, uh, I, I greeted that opportunity with enthusiasm. And in truth, uh, it, we, we gathered a series of individuals within the university who I felt would be the, had the resources, if you will, uh, to make this center reality. And my hope and expectation was that it would carry Compete Caribbean beyond uh, just funding, uh, the period of funding. And because invariably what happens is after the funding goes, uh, you know, the entity uh, ceases to exist. And uh, the, uh, the CCFSC has not disappointed. Uh, this forum uh, is one of many initiatives uh, that they have undertaken to enable the structural transformation of regional in economies and improve competitiveness through networking between public and private sector institutions. Uh, the centers actively sought to improve the regional's technical capacity on private sector competitiveness through the delivery of various workshops in collaboration with various international institutions and universities. And as I pointed out uh, before, they have concentrated on fields of cluster mapping, global value, global value chains, innovation policy, uh, and internationalization of small and medium enterprises throughout uh, the Caribbean. I mean, uh, I was just telling uh, Mr. Dennis Chung that, you know, I read his columns from time to time. I read all the columns, you know, in the Caribbean when I have the time. They all say what you're supposed to be doing. But, uh, you know, you know, where does the rubber hit the road? And, and I again emphasize that what excited me about this is that this was translated into something practical. I don't know what will become of it, but I know that these various foreign workshops in the Eastern Caribbean, in Jamaica, and so on, uh, really brought private sector entities, brought uh, small and business enterprises, innovative uh, individuals together to try to address and make a reality this whole concept of, of competitiveness and to do it in, in, in a really organized, uh, thoughtful, and structured way, you know, based on models uh, that already exist. We at the University of the West Indies and I have got to be at the forefront of, of development within the Caribbean. Uh, I believe that our, our regional university has the intellectual resources that, that does not exist in any other regional entity within the Caribbean. And, uh, you know, I, I say it is like the Jesuits. You know, the Jesuits are, as a, a world body, supposed to be, you know, the most able and thoughtful group of uh, religious people in the world today. I, I say within the context of our region, uh, we may not be as religious as we'd like, but certainly in terms of intellectual capital, I believe, across the region, we have it. And I would like, and I think we've been working hard for the university to, to, to be really meaningfully the instrument of change uh, within the Caribbean. And to the degree that we can, can uh, engender uh, entities such as the, the Caribbean Center for Competitiveness, the degree that we can link with international organizations to promote 
uh, the, the ideas of, of competition and competitiveness, to that degree we will be serving uh, some of what our mission is. Um, you'll hear a lot about the details of the uh, forum. Uh, there are some very practical uh, subjects being uh, dealt with services, food and beverages, manufacturing, and so on. Uh, so I hope that over the next two days, uh, participants will examine the real potential of the industries to be discussed uh, through cluster and global value chain methodologies uh, with the goal of designing a more, su more sustainable competitive strategies uh, for firms and industries. Uh, I, again, I really want to thank um, the organizers. I, you know, thank over and over again uh, the sponsors of this initiative, the IDV, DFID, uh, and uh, uh, the, the DFATD. <laughs> I can't even say DFAT, you know, we can't even call it anything uh, very easy. But in truth, let me say that I am hopeful, by the way, as I'm closing, that our relationship with this new entity in Canada is going to be absolutely as robust as our previous relationship uh, has been, because they've just been absolutely marvelous. So I, I hope that this is going to be a very fruitful, very meaningful conference, and uh, I thank you all for attending. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as you have been told, the Caribbean Center for Competitiveness is now located within the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies. And this is intended, the, the, the CCSC in fact is a regional institution, as is the as is the Salesis, and of course we will both interact with each other to strengthen that regional mandate. I often boast that the Salesis remains faithful to the original idea of UWE which is as a, regional, as, as a regional body. And as an organization, we do op operate as if we were one in institution. Now, I want to say a little bit about what we had planned with this in, in, in cooperation. Now, competitiveness is, uh, it is a, a matter that is on the agenda of individual scholars, some actually within this dissolesis. Individual scholars at the university and indeed some centers and, and departments, but there's no one person or one institution with a complete dedication to this very, very important discipline, as is the uh, CCFC. Now, given that we have made a decision as, as a region, as individual countries even, that there's a need to diversify our, our, our various economies, and that couldn't be on no other basis, but out of improved competitiveness, so that we could ensure the growth and development that the Vice Chancellor spoke to you about. The CCFC is positioned to be an important part of the region's institutional landscape. I mean, I would like to see it become as well known as the university itself, probably better known than the cricket team as, 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 as well, and, and, and I hope very much more effective uh, too. Now, and I do believe that this incorporation will allow the, uh, the institution to mix the current activity that it is involved in with robust research for which the Salesis and the University of the West Indies are, are, are well known. But the emphasis here is for the needs of the markets of the region. And I want to stress that, I'm, I'm probably going to say it uh, again, that we are hoping to develop the, the center into a center of scholarly excellence in the area of competitiveness but the emphasis is on the well-being and the promotion of the private sector, which includes public policy minister, which will influence the development of the, of, of, of the private sector. Well, this is a two-edged sword, eh? and, and, and to, 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 to the extent that we want to make sure, because we have often been told, and we, I, I, I don't deny it at times that we are something of an, of an ivory tower, but the intention of the center is to be of direct benefit to the needs of the private sector, which we believe, of course, to be for the needs of the region as a whole. The private sector plays an extremely important role in all-round development, 
and we want to genuinely contribute to that in a way that will be beneficial to us because we are in the business of, of scholarship, but we want that scholarship to be directly beneficial to the private sector. And why I say it's a two-edged sword is that sometimes we will require data and we're going to have to work out the means by which this, this becomes available. Too often, in my own experience, the private sector asks us to do something and they are unwilling to provide the, the data as well. And data, of course, is the lifeblood of the, of, the, of the social sciences. If we don't have it, there's very little that, that, that we can do. And we intend to, to do this to develop in using, in, in particular, as, as our a niche initially, studies in cluster development, global value chain, and innovation, innovation analysis as well. And, and, and my own commitment to that is that I have already started myself doing work in the, in, the, in, the general, in the general area. So over the next three years in particular, where we, where, 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 where we start the process, we will begin applying and merging pure and applied research on potential clusters, lead firms, institutional support and policy enablers towards developing cluster strategies for improving the region's competitiveness. And by that, it could only pass by the competitiveness of the individual firms. And we look forward to the support of the governments in this matter because it will require sometimes policy measures that facilitate the, the, the recommendations that, that, that we will make. Of course, and I think the Vice Chancellor mentioned that the Centre will also be seeking to develop key measurement indicators of competitiveness and innovation for, for the region. So all in all, we intend to become the regional thought leader on competitiveness positioning ourselves as the regional competitiveness think tank, articulating well-researched positions on regional competitiveness performance with concrete recommendations for improvement. The centre will host, as it does at, at this point in time, this regional competitiveness forum every other year, as well as open lectures on con contemporary competitiveness issues, and we shall produce a quarterly online competitiveness newsletter. I should mention as well that within the framework of the services, which we all know is, is already a center for uh, academic excellence, we also host a, a, an annual conference and we move it around between the, 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 the three main campuses. And, and for the first time next year, we are going to be going outside of the, of the, of the main campus. It's the turn of Jamaica, in fact, of Mona to host it, but it will be hosted this time in St. Lucia and you are all going to be invited to attend. We are doing this because uh, next year is the 100th anniversary of the birth of Sir Arthur Lewis, after whom the institution is named. So we will also become the clearinghouse, the region's clearinghouse for competitiveness case writing, and we have already started that process, as we build knowledge products documenting the region's experience with competitiveness initiatives, successes, and challenges. We also have developed and continue to develop an e-library, which will be a centralized repository of competitiveness knowledge. And we really are hoping that this will be guided by the scholarly activity that we carry out. When we hold seminars, I guess it will be guided by the results of the research that, 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 that we carry out. And we seek your guidance and your assistance in helping us carry out this research. As I indicated to you, we, we will be knocking on your doors in the name of Salesis, in the name of the University of the West Indies, to provide us with the required information, the required data that will help us to help, to, to help you. I should say to the private sector individuals, do we, uh, we are not asking in any way to be paid for this activity. The payment is in fact that a lot of the young scholars who are going to get involved, that's how they're going to advance in the university system by pursuing the scholarship that would be beneficial to you. That is the way we are hoping that this, that this is done. That's not to say that we may not be demanding funding of some kind from, from, from time to time, but that will not normally be the, the, the case. But as its original mandate, we will continue to work with regional governments and private sector institutions on projects to develop competitiveness strategies and seek project funding from international funding agencies such as the, the IDB to support our agenda. We are guided by the principle that in the long run we must be a sustainable self-financing entity at, and, 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 that, uh, and that is how we are, we are looking at it. The next few years may be a little bit problematic from, from that point of view as we seek to firmly put our, 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 our foot, our feet on the, on, on the ground. 
I want to thank you for listening to me, and I want you to, and I want to ask everyone in this room to understand what we are about, and to answer questions during the, the various coffee breaks and so on, and to understand that we are in the service of the region through principally service to the to the private sector, and at the same time we we are we want to develop in in doing this uh, our own internal capacity so that we will become the. Uh, organization that is best known for work on competitiveness in this part of the world. Thank you very much. Competitiveness, the issue of competitiveness as a country and by extension regionally continues to be brought to the forefront as we struggle with trying to bring about economic growth, not just in Jamaica but also regionally. And just about two or three years ago in my one of my hats as a, as a chartered accountant, I did a competitive analysis of the region at the Institute of Chartered Accountants Caribbean Conference of Accountants, which actually took place right here at the, the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel. Because I felt that this was necessary because over the years we have gained a reputation for producing anemic economies that are unable to generate any meaningful economic growth without a little um, spattering in, within the region that translates into any social equ equality and equity. Only recently Forbes magazine, for example, listed Jamaica as the fifth worst, worst economy in the world. One of the major areas of emphasis in my analysis was that competition is one of the primary factors that lead to economic growth. And we absolutely need to see the immediate creation of a facilitating environment that allows competition to meet the demand. And I should pause here to say that this is why I believe that the current economic program that Jamaica is on is actually for the first time in maybe the, the, um, the 13 or 14 other IMF agreements for the first time, we're actually on the right path because what we are doing this time is we're addressing the structural impediments that have caused a problem with competitiveness and productivity in Jamaica. And how do we do that? We need to first look at the institutions that are vitally important to enhancing our competitiveness and attempt to rehabilitate those. And going back to the, the, the current program again, what we've seen is that over the past few months, what we've been doing is not just attacking the fiscal issues, which are, are a big problem. And Dr. King, Damon King, will tell you that the fiscal is the only problem or maybe the main problem. But also what we're doing is we're attacking the structural impediments in terms of the legislative infrastructure. And within the private sector, it has been welcomed. We've seen confidence returning to the private sector because of that, and more investments are now taking place as a result. And I'm pretty confident that if we can continue on this path, and continue to address things like crime that we will see some, some return of vibrancy to the economy. So for us in Jamaica, what it means is that the bureaucracy has to be made substantially more efficient and business friendly if we're going to move forward. It also means that comprehensive tax reform with low rates and a broader base is also a critical part and I emphasize here, going into the budget, Minister, lower rates. <laughs> it's a critical part of creating an enabling business environment for equitable growth. Energy, of course, is a huge drag on growth, and we have to find a way to provide competitively priced energy for our businesses, because this is one of the primary reasons why we have seen the the GDP component switch from a uh, manufacturing base to a services based economy. Let us not forget the major problems of crime and an inadequate justice system 
And um, I, I don't know how you want to look at the recent vibes scatter case to see if, if it actually was adequate or not, but 65 days is a long time for a trial. Um, but there are, there are some significant issues to be addressed there, and we at the PSOJ have been meeting with the, um, the ministers of National Security and Justice, the Commissioner of Police, and also the Chief of Just Chief Justice to address some of these issues. Um, so again, we can say that the government has been very accommodating in that respect. A significant factor in our ability to achieve economic growth, however, is our productivity levels. Productivity is the essential ingredient of competitiveness, and without it, international trade is virtually impossible for us. According to the Jamaica Productivity Center, labor productivity or output per worker has been declining in Jamaica at an average annual rate of 1.3% over the period 1973 to 2007 when the study ended. As a matter of fact, the GDP, the real GDP per capita in, in 2007 was 90% of what it was in 1972. For the period, and it gets worse, 2003 to 2007, this decline has actually increased to 1.8% per annum. Mean, meanwhile, between 2002 and 2011, labor productivity in Jamaica declined on average by 3.2% annually. On the other hand, for most of our trading partners and neighbors in the Caribbean, output per worker has been advancing by more than 1.5% annually since 1972, and more than 2% during the last 10 years. So if you want to know what the difference is, in our economic challenges and what we see elsewhere in the region. This, I think, says it all. Indeed, the JPC report notes that this slow growth and low productivity cycle that we are trapped in has resulted in our standard of living being almost stagnant over the past 30 years. So it is with this knowledge that we look forward to hearing from the speakers today, who are scheduled for today and tomorrow, on how best we can incentivize our workers, encourage innovation, and increase our competitiveness both as a country and a, as a region. And I also look forward to the comments from the minister, who I'm sure will be addressing these things. Has been a pet peeve with your minister, I know that. And we look forward to that. So in closing, I'd like to once again thank you for coming and also thank Indira and her team for putting this conference together and we wish you all the success. I'd like to begin my remarks with a quote from Steve Jobs, former CEO and founder of Apple. Innovation comes from people meeting up in the hallways of, or calling each other at 10.30 at night with a new idea or because they realize something that shoots holes in how we've been thinking about a problem. As Steve Jobs notes, innovation comes at the most unexpected times, sometimes in the middle of the night or outside of our meeting rooms. Fundamental to innovation is what I would like to term constructive deviance. That is constructively challenging the status quo so that a better solution can be found. And I'll give a segue here. The Chinese, you know, they're, they're incredible people and it's the reason why they're running the world now. When they realized that deviance was effectively what innovation was about, they started schools on how to be deviant. Now, the Caribbean doesn't need a school on that. We're already, all we need is the constructive part. So if we can just engage the constructive deviance, we'll be way ahead of the game. So having said that, let me continue. The state of the affairs in the region requires a paradigm shift away from the status quo if we're going to emerge from the current economic slump. I'm a firm believer in the need to ensure that our private sector increases its competitiveness as the way of doing business is not the same as it was 20 or 30 years ago. As markets are liberalized and technological advances are made every day, our private sector needs to be infused with innovation, especially as they seek to occupy higher positions in global value chains. And I see Mr. Levi Roots is here, who was part of our forum in London during the Olympics and has been a trailblazer, to put it mildly. Welcome. 
Adding value to products and services becomes paramount when competing on the global stage. We have witnessed the benefits accrued to firms who understand the importance of creating value. Recently, Caribbean Export supported 11 firms in the specialty food sector to participate in Anuga, the largest food and beverage trade show in the world held in Germany. Of the 11 Caribbean firms that attended, three of them, Banks Holdings from Barbados, Marie Sharp from Belize, and Baron Foods, who are here, were awarded the coveted Taste 13 Award, which was awarded to 54 companies deemed to carry innovative products. That is three out of 54 Bearing in mind that nearly 7,000 companies exhibit at Anuga, that is an amazing feat. And I think that needs to be recognized. So our innovativeness is not in question. It is our ability to, to, to challenge, channel that in a way that is productive. This is testimony to the fact that we have world-class brands doing business every day in our region. International buyers were impressed with the value added and differentiation displayed among our companies. One of the companies as well, Smax Teas, out of Trinidad, was able to secure a major distributor of his teas and chai rum in the Nordic countries. Before Anuga had been completed, Smax Teas had already been ordered at the prestigious Intercontinental Hotel in France. Another company, Baron Foods, which is present also here today as I indicated, was also selected for the award for their innovative product, Banana Ketchup. Now, if you want to talk about value added, Banana industry was dying. We translated that. And that's what innovation is all about, changing how we use what we've already had for a very long time. They've also had substantial interest from buyers in Switzerland, Germany, and Denmark. I draw examples of these two companies because they have created and sought to be innovative and had added value to the standard activities involved in bringing their products to market. Innovation must be incorporated throughout the value chain in order for firms to be competitive, whether it is at the level of design, production, marketing, distribution, or after-sales support. There are many ways for regional firms to start rethinking or constructively deviating away from the usual way of doing business. In July 2013, Caribbean Export also hosted a successful brand development and packaging workshop with Brand42, a London-based award-winning company that works with brands such as CNN and Louis Vuitton. Through this initiative, 151 companies from 13 carry forum countries were exposed to cutting edge ways of packaging and labeling their products so that they could stand out in export markets. We subsequently provided access to grants to companies interested in rebranding their products. As an agency working to support the private sector, it is our responsibility to constantly push past the status quo to offer differentiated yet critical support to firms so that as a region we can reap the benefits of a globally competitive private sector. I would like to challenge all of us to go beyond this forum and start asking the question, how are we going to shape and influence the thinking of our future entrepreneurs? They are the ones who will be required to create new products and do not exist and do not yet exist based on changing consumer demands. Being competitive and innovative begins in our thinking. I believe one way in which we can influence young minds is through the establishment of one of my pet projects at the moment, is an innovator's creativity, creativity park for our youth. This would provide them with an outlet to express their creativity in an environment which could become the breeding ground for new business ideas or processes. We also need to not only rethink our education system to make sure that we're cultivating the types of minds that our region so dearly needs, but we're willing to and somebody told me not to use this word, but I tend to be dramatic, to disembowel a system that has been designed to create, from the nursery to tertiary level, adults who fear change and actively discourage uniqueness and individual thought. Vice Chancellor, I'm saying this openly and honestly, you know my issues with our education system, starting from this GSAT this week and the common entrance in Barbados and the horrible systems that we put our children through and then expect them when they get to adulthood to be creative and to be innovative and to fight the status quo. Sorry, I just had to put that in. We must start grooming the future generation to become problem solvers so that in years to come, the challenges we face today, such as poor inter-regional transportation, took me three days to get here, do not continue to hinder trade. With this in mind, I would like to leave you with the story of Sir Arthur Lewis, the distinguished St. Lucian economist and Nobel Prize laureate in economics, and of course, the person under whom this falls. 
Sir Arthur Lewis had a visionary father who recognized the limitations in the then education system of his home country and took on the responsibility of educating his son for a period of time. In his biography, he wrote, my progress through the public schools was accelerated. When I was seven, I had to stay home for several weeks because of some ailment, whereupon my father elected to teach me so that I should not fall behind. In fact, he taught me in three months as much as the school taught in two years. So on returning to school, I was shifted from grade four to grade six. Sir Arthur Lewis went on, of course, as we know, to become one of the greatest minds this region has produced. I share this story to say, let us not settle for the status quo with regards to our education system, our private sector, our approach to our niche sectors, or anything else. Let us always keep in mind that our approach to private sector development must come from a viewpoint that goes beyond the current way of thinking so that we can propel our companies further on the global stage. Bearing in mind the fact that the last seven words of any dying organization tends to be, but we've always done it this way. Thank you. Um, the, uh, most of what I was going to say has been said, so luckily it will be a much shorter presentation. Uh, with regard to the uh, comments made about Compete Caribbean, I have to recognize my IDB colleagues who are here. Uh, I think it's been a very, very useful collaboration, Canada, UK, CDB, and IDB. Um, it's had several spin-offs. Um, of course, there's also the Caribbean Growth Forum, that's with you know, the IMF, World Bank, CDB, and ourselves and others. Um, what's it all about? The main thing is what we have been doing, I think this is what how Pamela ended, uh, isn't working. The fact is that business as usual and the policy environment, maybe some companies can uh, have a make a go of it, can be successful in spite of the context. But I think that what we're seeing is the context matters. That's the, the uh, governance context. Um, the I was given a speech, so that's the first page is done. Here's, here's the, I'm just going to give you the points that I think are I think worth remembering. Uh, the competitiveness index of the World Economic Forum is quite interesting because it causes us to lift our eyes out of the region. We tend to compare ourselves with our neighbors in the region. And it compares us with all small economies around the world. And What's interesting is the, and this I'll read, that relative to the other small developing economies around the world, ours in the English-speaking Caribbean uh, report, a lower level of public trust of politicians and a belief that there's a higher level of unproductive rent-seeking. Government officials are considered to engage in a greater level of a diversion of public funds to have a greater degree of wastefulness in government spending, show greater favoritism, and engage in a higher level of irregular um, transactions. Uh, a fact is that foreign ownership is low. And that feeds into another uh, re uh, reported uh, position of the private sector in our part of the world, that um, there are palpable uh, obstacles to new players. Um, in essence, Caribbean business persons think that governments may be pro to some business persons, but are not good for business. And objectively, as we heard from uh, Dennis, um, we're sliding. You know, we used to be ahead of that grouping of small economies around the world. We used to be out in front in terms of productivity. We used to be out in front in terms of living standards, out in front in terms of growth. And that's no longer the case. They've caught up and they've passed us. Um, the fact is, as Dennis said, our productivity has gone stagnant. Our exports are flat. Um, our public debt has gone up trying to bridge and make up for that. And our living standards are falling. Uh, this is also supported, this, this, these reported um, perceptions by the private sector is supported by the World Bank's Doing Business Index, which suggests that countries in our region are falling behind in terms of competitiveness policy, not just competitiveness, but policy, 
and regulatory reforms, uh, which is also what Dennis was talking about, is that finally, at least in one case, in his opinion, the structural uh, causes for that slide are being addressed. Um, and according to this, our policies, not just our competitive, but our policies for competitiveness are behind all other small developing countries in the world. Now, I don't like to read speeches, but I'm going to read this paragraph to you because it, it hit me. The other side of the competitiveness agenda is our country's private sector profiles. In other words, one thing is the context, and one thing is the opinion of the private sector about the, the governance context in which they operate. The other thing is, well, what does our private sector look like? What we need is dynamic, innovative, exporting firms. So we have some examples from Pamela and have some success stories. However, using the enterprise surveys financed by Compete Caribbean, we find that the average firm is small, old, locally owned, and does not engage in international trade, either as an importer or as an exporter. It spends more on security than on research and development. It spends more on security than on research and development. Conclusion, we do not have a dynamic, innovative, exporting business uh, sector in the Caribbean, which, without which the growth that is needed will not happen. And I have to say a plug for um, that balance that has to be struck. Dennis spoke about the IMF number 13, I think you said, or whatever the number is, agreement that is currently going on in Jamaica. Well, it's not a Jamaican phenomenon. Even countries that have minerals or export commodities, Guyana, Suriname, Trinidad and Tobago, you've seen that we are all in the same boat. Whether we are service-based economies or we are lucky enough to have commodities, you, as you've noticed with the recent swings in commodity prices, nobody's immune. Nobody has an easy way out of this. Fiscal compression and fiscal uh, balance and external balance is essential. Without that stability, the prospect of competitiveness and growth will be dark. That said, fiscal compression on its own won't do the trick. We will not get out of our, our high debt, low growth trap just by tightening our belts. Without growth, the, the way forward uh, cannot just rely on fiscal compression. And hence the focus of this conference, and thank you to Indira and her team for putting it on. Um, I'll say just four things now. Uh, in terms of uh, keys to helping to change the landscape, this is not policy now, it's not the profile of the firms, it is uh, another area which is we have untapped liquidity in the region, in some countries, huge amounts of liquidity in commercial banks, and in other countries we have rail sectors that can't that have good projects and can't get it financing. We have a regional issue in terms of our financial sector. There are some things that can only happen through joint action. We all know the experience with CARICOM. We know the, the disappointed um, objectives or the frustrated objectives. I think there's something that is uh, essential though. Joint action can make some things possible that aren't possible one country at a time. For example, it, it's what we're working on now is the possibility of a regional energy market. What does that mean? The recent changes in the natural gas market, we cannot, it would be hard for a small country with 80,000 people to benefit from that all on its own because of economies of scale. To get a supplier to put gas on a ship and come to one country with 80,000 um, consumers isn't going to happen. It could be though that if several uh, uh, destinations or several consuming countries could be joined together, then all of a sudden that could make it possible to benefit from those, from those changes in the natural gas um, prices. But, and that's something that we have on our front burner. 
Another thing that we could do, a comment was made by Pamela to do what we used to do, but do it in a different way and do it better. We're also working on an air bridge, an air bridge between Brazil. It doesn't have to, it's starting with Brazil. It doesn't, it should not be limited to Brazil and four destina tourist destinations in the region. Why? We typically don't try to sell our services, to our tourism services to Latin America. We typically don't even notice Latin America is there. We've done studies in the IDB that shows that had our economies been linked to Latin America versus North America and Europe, we would have grown 3% faster in the last two decades. Um, anyway, here we are today. So what are we looking at? We're looking at, once again, through joint action, if it's possible for companies out of Brazil, or it could be a Caribbean company, so far, so far only one has come forward to offer the service, it is possible to get uh, a flight a day out of Brazil into the Caribbean, into four destinations. Now, that might sound like a small thing, but as you know, once a flight like that with a cargo capacity starts going, other possibilities come. Um, uh, recently, one of the most interesting projects, not the biggest one, that we uh, approved last year was the Global Services Project in Trinidad and Tobago which is to get serious about, we all know that in all our many, many uh, countries, um, back office, call centers, we've been nibbling at the edges, but we haven't really got serious about it in a structured way. This effort, which is really, the idea came from Uruguay, three million people, a country in South America that few people, I think, think about, but with an incredible example for us of what they were able to do in terms of, of improving on what they were doing already and linking themselves into the world market uh, to provide services. Uh, in October, there's the America's Competitiveness Forum, first time a Caribbean, uh, an English-speaking Caribbean country will have hosted it. That will be in Port of Spain in October. Um, once again, um, very, very important for repositioning ourselves. And I have to join everybody else in recognizing uh, Levi. Um, I was lucky enough to meet him last year. And what blew me away was that what it shows is the incredible capacity of the Caribbean in, uh, innovation and the unique culture and vibes that we have uh, to enter a market and to outperform uh, traditional brands like Heinz. You'd think it'd be unassailable. Um, uh, and to be larger than... I think this is true, if I'm not, you can correct me. Larger than the two largest quoted companies on the Jamaica Stock Exchange combined. Now that's not a detail, that's huge. And it shows the possibilities. Anyway, I probably went beyond what I, the time I had, but thank you, and I'm glad to see you at the conference. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here at this very important event, and I'd like to thank the Caribbean Centre for Competitiveness for organising it. It really is excellent to see the Caribbean Centre bringing all of these people together, all of you together, who individually and collectively, you hold the keys, a lot of the keys, for growth and competitiveness in the Caribbean, for growth. So, just looking, if you look outside the window, you can see one of the aspects that make the Caribbean so inviting. There are so many opportunities in tourism, there are so many opportunities in terms of market proximity, the international languages, the stable institutions, and the reputation for investing in the social sectors. The Caribbean has a lot to offer. Yet we also know that there are very high levels of debt, there is great vulnerability to natural disasters, and there's a lack of productivity, a lack of innovation, and a lack of diversification, and that holds growth and the global competitiveness back. Now, the UK government supports regional competitiveness through its £75 million programme in the Caribbean, and this programme runs from 2011 to 2015. And our bilateral assistance to the region has increased in recent years, and this reflects how much the region matters to the UK. Our links are based on a shared history and a very strong and vibrant diaspora. Total UK aid to the region is running at around £50 million a year, now more than half of that goes to the independent Caribbean and the remainder to the UK overseas territories. And that's in addition to the support that we channel to the European Union, the Caribbean Development Bank, the World Bank and the IDB. 
Now, the overarching focus of our programme is on improving prosperity and tackling the vulnerabilities that undermine sustainable growth. We've got three main pillars. We've got climate change and disaster risk reduction. We've got growth and security and growth and sorry, governance and security and growth and wealth creation. And under this, we've got a number of initiatives that are aimed at stimulating the private sector and helping the region to compete. And let me just give a, a few examples. So we support a, a £10 million programme, a CARP Fund Aid for Trade and Regional Integration Programme, and that helps carry foreign countries improve exports and trade. It provides technical advice on product quality and standards to tackle technical barriers. It helps build export market intelligence and contacts, and it enhances public sector to capacity to implement the economic partnership agreement with the EU. The programme is also working with the Caribbean Export Development Agency to support the private sector in areas such as speciality foods. And secondly, to help manage the high levels of debt which constrain investment, we have a £10 million programme supporting the IMS Caribbean Regional Technical Assistance Centre and financial sector strengthening uh, in the OECS. And this facility also supports the public financial management programme with the World Bank here in Jamaica. And of course, we're one of the main partners in the Compete Caribbean Regional Competitiveness Programme with a £10 million contribution. This programme has been supporting the Caribbean Centre for Competitiveness and it'll have a strong presence over the next two days. It is fantastic to see that several of the centre's case studies are going to be presented over these two days. And we've been impressed with the high quality training being carried out by the centre involving world-class researchers and practitioners. For example, the training for business support organisations from, for, from 13 countries was followed by a real increase in the quality of cluster proposals within the Compete Enterprise Innovation Challenge Fund. This is part of a project that provides funds to innovative companies to increase their revenues and exports. We now have 11 cluster plans that have been recommended for funding, ranging from a shrimp cluster in Belize to Treasure Beach here in Jamaica and the coconut water cluster in Guyana, as well as a further 15 business plans with individual firms. Now, we expect that the Challenge Fund will generate more than $105 million dollars in increased exports of goods. That is significant. Goods, services and revenues. And to create over 5,000 jobs. That really is something to celebrate if we can achieve that. Now through Compete Caribbean we're also supporting a number of policy and legislative reforms across the region. As well as knowledge generation on regional competitiveness. The enterprise surveys of 2010 are an example of this. And they provide comparative analysis of Caribbean firms in terms of their sales growth, employment, and productivity. As Gerard noted, the studies showed that Caribbean firms tend to be smaller, older, and less involved in foreign trade when compared to other small economies. Now, we look forward to a vibrant Compete panel session covering issues of global market integration later on this morning. We also welcome the forum discussion on the new regional study on ecotourism that the project has supported. Diversification in tourism is needed to help reverse declining global competitiveness. It's vital to look at ways to expand the product on offer and to improve marketing and branding. So let me just reiterate how excited we are to be part of this event and to hear the range of rich case studies and analytical studies being pre presented from across the region. And we look forward to a, a stimulating and productive event. And I'd just like to add that I have tasted for the first time here in Jamaica beetroot ketchup which I think has got a great global uh, competitive advantage as well as prospects. So it should be competing with mines. So thank you very much. Like Jerry, I don't have much to say anymore. <laughs> Coming <laughs> second or eighth uh, uh, on this panel. But basically, well, I can't really tell you much more about the CCFC, the center itself, because uh, a lot has been said already. And I'm very pleased that we're here today as the center is about to celebrate its third birthday next week. So this is a big accomplishment. Very proud to be part of this. Can't talk to you about competitiveness because you'll hear about it in the next day, today and tomorrow. And a lot already has, has been said. Can't talk to you better than Dennis has done about the challenges that Jamaica faces. Um, and I certainly will not talk to you about UK aid. <laughs> 
But I will tell you why Canada is here today. Um, and why we're present and we've been present. I don't, ha I don't have to go back to the history of the ties between Canada and the region, uh, which go, go back to a long time, and are present every day today in our, in our lives, uh, in our ties between, uh, between the, the region and the, and the country and Canada. Um, it's just, a, just as an example of those ties, as you know, uh, we are engaged as of last week, two weeks ago, in very intensive trade negotiations, uh, discussions between Canada and CARICOM. Um, these negotiations uh, have been going on for a while, but are moving on to a very intensive phase right now. And um, trade negotiations, tra trade actually, um, increase of increased trade is uh, an element of growth as we know it, and many generally. Um, and this is why we've, we've been engaged in this process for a while. We hope to complete it by the summer, by June. Um, and if we complete it successfully, as we hope, uh, it will be mutually, mutually beneficial for the region and for Canada. So this is something that we're looking for. It, and it's just one example of why we have such uh, ties between uh, the region and, and the country. In 2008, um, we engage in a different relationship with the region. We used to have, in terms of our uh, international support, we used to have bilateral relationships which move to a regional support. As Jerry said, it is very important to work, especially in a region, a small region like the, the Caribbean. It is essential, and this is something that, that the region has expressed to us. So we moved our, our program to a program supporting the regional integration of the region. We have put, Prime Minister Harper came here in 2009 and announced a commitment of an envelope of $600 million Canadian for over 10 years, which is about $60 million a year, more or less, uh, dedicated to supporting your priorities, the priorities of the region, mainly economic growth and um, also uh, security. So for us, um, how has it translated in those years since then, which is about five years now? It has translated basically uh, in focusing on the productivity of small and medium-sized firms for regional and global markets, enhancing access to skills for both employment and entrepreneurship to prepare youth to succeed in the global economy, including youth at risk, and strengthening the management of public finances and debt toward the fiscal state. Where Canada is seeking to advance the rule of law in the region, especially here in Jamaica, we, we've been engaged in the, in the justice sector for a long time and we will continue to be. We're also engaging the, in the citizen security sector now with our, with our colleagues here at the table from the IDB and UK. But also at the regional level, we are working with UWE on many things, including the issue of, uh, of, uh, of rule of law and we're working also with the Caribbean Court of Justice. Um, we're also helping build regional capacity to manage and respond to natural disasters in order to reduce vulnerability and insecurity, which we all know is a, is a big uh, priority for the region because you will not change every year or so there are uh, disasters that can hit the region. We recognize that investing in the development of private sector is critical, I think everybody here would agree, um, to achieve sustainable growth and to uh, help the region recover from the impacts. Um, as has been said many times before, we have been supporting Compete Caribbean with our colleagues in the IDB and UK since 2010, since the creation of the, well, the initiation of Compete Caribbean. Um, Daniel has outlined a lot of the achievements so far of Compete Caribbean. It has been a very dynamic program in the region. Um, we has already a lot of results. That, as I said, uh, Daniel has outlined some of them, but uh, I, uh, we're very happy to be, uh, to be supporting Compete Caribbean and to be associated with it. In addition to Compete Caribbean, uh, how this $600 million has been translated so far, we're still in implementation, of course, but there is a lot of current programming that is going on. For example, we work with the International Financial Corporation in the areas of PPPs and access to finance. And for example, uh, we've been supporting the creation of credit bureaus in the region. Uh, you might know, you might be aware that uh, tomorrow there is a, 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 a 
workshop on a seminar on credit bureau supervision uh, here hosted by the, the Central Bank of Jamaica. So this is one of the initiatives that we've been doing. We've been doing it in other countries, in Guyana and Belize also. We're working with the World Bank in the area of promoting entrepreneurship. And some months ago, uh, probably two months ago, Mr. Hilton, correct me if I'm wrong, we've launched the scientific uh, the collaboration between the Scientific Research Council and the Caribbean Industrial Research Institute, Cariri, in Trinidad and Tobago, which will be, uh, as part of the program, will be an, an incubator institution for promoting um, climate change innovation and entrepreneurship in the region. So that's just one example of what the EPIC program is going to be doing. We're working at a local level also with, uh, through the Canadian Municipal um, uh, Federation of Canis Municipal Federation of Canadian Municipalities to work at the at the local level. So we're working um, uh, here with uh, local government to promote economic growth at a local level and put in place an enabling environment for small businesses to grow. Um, Today's forum has a very, very long agenda, so I will not continue very long here. As you've seen, there's a lot of case studies that will be presented for the work that Indira and her team are, are going to uh, have been working on, um, on medical tourism, ecotourism, value chains, all models of what competitiveness is and what it can achieve. So I hope this will be very useful for us here to listen and see what this research has done in the last, uh, last year and a half since, I guess, the last forum, which took place a year and a half ago. So just, uh, I hope, I'm very happy to be here with my colleagues uh, and with partners. I'd like to thank and Indira and her team for the work that has been done.